Attention, please. You're having a visitor. Uh, Howard Campbell, Jr. I've just come back from the Russian front, so I'll make it short. I don't want to take up your time. I know how hungry you are. Food's not much, though, is it? Food's terrific. Almost as neat as your outfit. <laughs> Man, I have a proposition for you. How would you like to come back to America with me after this war as heroes? It's great, as long as I can wear that fag outfit. <laughs> Since you're so interested in my outfit, I'll tell you what it's about. Blue is for the American sky. White is for the race that pioneered that continent, cleared the forests, drained the swamps, built the roads and the bridges. And the red is for the blood of fine American boys that's been shed in defense of your freedom. I don't see you shedding any blood, Campbell. You all know that communism is out to enslave the world. And who's out there trying to stop them? The Germans. They're not your enemies. They're your allies. Communism is the enemy of all of us. Now, I want volunteers for the Free American Corps. <coughs> Men who are willing to stand up to these commies. Sit down, Lozano. I didn't vote for you, Derby. Good. Now, who's next? I'll tell you, men, if we don't stop them now, they're going to... Everybody moves to the air shelter. <laughs> Vonnegut, I'm looking for Thornton Mellon. Uh, want to come in? Dad? Hello, and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Fit Chick. Hi, everyone. I am still, I still have a, I was just saying before we got on the air, I still have the little coffee frog in my throat. Um, apologies in advance if I, if I missed hitting the mute button in time. Um, but we are so excited to talk about today's, I don't think we've ever talked about this author. Mm-mm. Probably my favorite American author, I oh, think. Oh, really? I, I can say, yeah. Um, huge fan for many, many, many years, and I cannot wait to talk about it. But in case you're new, yes, this is a podcast where we read books, then we watch the movies that they're adapted into. When the pandemic started, oh, so many years ago now, um, we made a commitment to do a brand new episode every single week. And in order to achieve that, uh, we have expanded what we mean by quote unquote book. I'm making quotey fingers. Um, And really, we are, are covering any film that has been adapted from any kind of literary source. Today, we are talking about a a book adaptation, but sometimes we're talking about a magazine article or a short story or a song even. Um, So we are always looking for ideas. This is September. It is Banned Book Month. So we're going to be talking about banned books that have been adapted into movies all month long. Um, But if you have suggestions for next month that we're doing spooky movies, um, we've got some themes coming up. There's a few places where you can make those suggestions, meet other listeners of this podcast, and interact with us on the internet. We do have a basic Facebook page. Be sure to like it. But we also have a Facebook group, and that's where we're a little more interactive. And also you can talk to other people who are part of the podcast group. That's book versus movie podcast group just ask to join and we ask that the book needs to be something that's pretty easy to get you can also use a song or a magazine article a newspaper article a short story whatever as long as it's been adapted and we can get our hands on it and the movie has to be something that's on a major streaming service or it's on youtube if it's something that we have to get a vhs or a dvd for we just it's just not going to happen because it has to be something that everybody can be able to watch and and we're also on Twitter and Instagram. You spell out book versus and movie there. And we have uh, an old timey email. It's book versus movie podcast. Spell it all out at gmail.com. And if you would like some stickers or a magnet, just send us an email and we'll drop that in the mail for you. 
And if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies, you can also support us on Patreon. And I think we have a new Patreon supporter. Is that right? We do. Natalie just joined us. Thank you so much, Natalie. We're at P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We'll be putting up all of our episodes from 2020 and then previous to that. And that is going to include, by the way, all of our old holiday episodes and Halloween-ish episodes are all starting to go up there. That's going to go behind the Patreon wall because most of the apps just go back two years now or 125 episodes i've discovered and we've been at this for eight years eight years folks. guys so <laughs> we've got some stephen king episodes that are going up there all the holiday episodes so what we're doing now um so anyway we just put up the big sleep we have some really great episodes up there we have a couple of very affordable options so once again thank you to natalie for doing that we totally appreciate that but if money is tight and we totally understand that if you could just you know review us wherever you get your podcast leave us a few stars leave a review that would be great and on good pods we're always re- doing really well there or you know just ask for stickers put it on your laptop or just tell a friend about the show or share it on social media that would be great I, like I said, I cannot wait to talk about today's yes. book and movie. I had not read this. <coughs> excuse me. I had not seen this movie ever, actually. I had never seen it. Me neither. But I have read the book several times, although it's, it had been a long time since I last read Slaughterhouse Five. I just, I cannot wait to talk about Mr. Kurt Vonnegut. First of all, Kurt Vonnegut, I should say, he has this, he and my husband have the same birthday. Oh, what day is that? November 11th. Oh. And Kurt Vonnegut's uh, birthday is 11 11 22, which I think is Oh, that's witchy. Suspicious. Yeah. Oh, wow. This is a case where we we have to do this every once in a while, kind of lean into it, but people do spend their entire academic careers talking oh, people about people have degrees in, in yeah. In Vonnegut. In Vonnegut. <laughs> yeah. Or in band books or in Indeed. the films of George Roy Hill. I mean, people do study this extensively so understand that you know every week we put out a new episode and we go into a different pond and sometimes we're talking about a graphic novel sometimes it's a, a children's book sometimes we have a month of disney films and sometimes it's a, it's a grim's fairy tale so just so you know it's kind of like a big overall thing that we're going into so if you're a kurt vonnegut Super fan. Margot probably will be doing the heavy lifting in this episode. If this were a Stephen King episode, I would tend to do more of that. If you uh, so, it depends on our our interests. But this is one of the most talked about novels of the 20th century. I think it's one of the most highly. I think praised. so. Yeah. And yeah. He's a very interesting character. I will always remember him from Back to School. I'll definitely include that Me clip. Me too. <laughs> You should, but you should also link. You should link your recent dorking out where you yes. guys were talking about Back to School. I love Back to School. But Back to School is a great movie with Rodney Dangerfield, and it's a lot sweeter than you remember it for an '80s comedy. Um, but Kurt Vonnegut, uh, he hires Kurt Vonnegut to help him get an A in English. <laughs> it's it's fabulous. But yeah, so let's talk about it. It's Banned Book Month. This is one of those banned books that come out there, and we have to understand why. I didn't read this until I was a freshman in college and I went to junior college first. I went to Diablo Valley College. So I didn't get this in high school. I definitely, I think I was in high school. I'm pretty sure I had to have been in high school. I think by the time I got to college, I probably had read almost all of his stuff. But yeah, he's from really interesting history. We, um, oh wait, I keep forgetting. You did not go to Indianapolis when we went to Indianapolis no, for that we became conference. Friends, because we were both a part of a group of fitness bloggers, and we're both named Margo, and we both have a size nine sneaker. Like there's just certain things we had in common, and s- somehow a friendship formed, and we started this podcast. But there was a year where this conference took place in Indianapolis, and Margo was able to go, and I wasn't. And, That's right. And Margo, you were you went to, there. I he's from loved there. it. He's from there. And let me just say, I so enjoyed the city of Indianapolis. I was very pleasantly surprised. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, my friend Jennifer and I ate at a revolving restaurant um, that overlooks it, I think, more than once. I think we went there more than once, if I remember correctly. Um, but definitely for me, the highlight of my – there were two highlights. One was my trip to – um, the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library, which is very small, but is I highly recommend. Go if you're in Indianapolis, go. Just, just you won't be sorry. Um, and the other highlight was going to the TJ Maxx in downtown Indianapolis, um, which I believe it is still the TJ Maxx. Um, and here's why: 
you're walking around downtown Indianapolis and you go into this building for the TJ Maxx and it is in um, what clearly once was probably in the maybe in the 30s, 40s, kind of art deco. There, It must at one point have been a very, very, very fancy um, department store. And I'm blanking on the name, WH something. Okay. And the- Strauss? In- no, no. It was a name like Merrick or something like that. Mm-hmm. But anyway, if you go to the TJ Maxx and you go inside, you can see all of the beautiful Art Deco architecture in this TJ Maxx, the most gorgeous TJ Maxx I've ever seen in my life. And that building was designed by Kurt Vonnegut Sr. Oh, my goodness. So Kurt, got, Kurt Vonnegut's family was very interesting. They were um, – I forget what they – if they were like – farmers or something anyway one one part of the family went into to kind of trades and the other family went into kind of the sciences and that's the that's the part of the family that kurt vonnegut is from um and yes his father and i think his grandfather too were i think they were both architects yes right and they were german and then world and they're both of his parents he's born in 1922 like you said in indianapolis and both of his parents were german and they could speak german but they became just kind of disgusted with her World War One. And and he often said throughout his life that World War One kind of like turned the world differently. This is before he was even born. But he he's saying that uh, they lost their fortune because also part of their fortune was in architecture. That was part of where their wealth was, but also it was from spirits. They also own bars. And the so when they so eventually when there was the Great Depression and then there was also the there was the what's the word I'm thinking of prohibition excuse me they lost their money there so Kurt Vonnegut was raised he had two siblings and his father and mother had um, a very strained relationship he was very close to they had an African American maid who lived with them and she was the one who taught him to be a humanist he that which is the the ethics that he carried with him throughout his life. He was a proclaimed atheist and he just believed in humanity and being kind. And that was sort of like his ethics, that is his ethos. He was very shy. His mother was always worried about money. He tried several different things. He went into world, he went to Cornell University, he went to several universities, very smart. Um, He also loved humor and used humor to try to win people over to make friends and that kind of thing. He was kind of awkward. And during World War I, he was very young, and he served, and he was in the Battle of the Bulge. His, his mother, by the way, died by suicide just before he was sent to serve. Yeah, so he, um, um, yeah, so he fought in World War II, and... and I forget how old he is when he goes off to war. He's, He's like very, very young. 21, 22, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And um, his brother, what's his brother's name? He starts with a B. Bernard? Bernard um, was a very famous um, scientist. His brother claimed a fame, if you will, was that he was instrumental in working on the process of seeding clouds. So when you... They used to they used to shoot like uh, dry ice into clouds to make it rain or to make it snow. Um, it was a thing that they thought that they could like control the weather and then also weaponize the weather. Oh my goodness! <laughs> and he came up, yeah. So he d- he was part of a team that developed um, I forget some kind of chemical instead of dry ice. They were using this other chemical that was more effective, something that was, the government considered weaponizing. It was this whole big project. Um, and so yeah, Kurt Vonnegut. I think he studied chem. I think Kurt studied like chemistry or yeah, something like that. He, he wasn't wanted, very successful with it. No, he wanted to do writing and art. And that was a big deal. He loved to doodle. He was also a big doodler. So he gets sent to, and this is also very personal to me because my father's uncle, my uncle Jerry, my dad's uncle Jerry, was the same age in, um, when he was sent, he, the Pearl Harbor was bombed. He grew up in Far Rockaway. And then he was sent to the Philippines and then he was kidnapped. He was um the Japanese, and he did the March of Bataan, the Bataan Death March, and then he was a prisoner of war for almost four years. And then my other uncle, his brother, was then kept stateside. He joined the Navy, but they wouldn't send him over because of that. It's just, it's, war is horrifying, by the way. That's like the whole point. Like, he did get out, but his experience was horrifying. So Kurt Vonnegut, 
I have Kurt Cobain on my brain because I saw this movie over the weekend <laughs> set in Spokane, Washington. So I have to like tell myself not to say Kurt Cobain. But Kurt Vonnegut, so he's in the Battle of the Bulge, very famous war. He then is kidnapped. Well, well he's also captured, excuse me, not kidnapped. He's captured. I don't know why I keep saying kidnapped. Captured by the Germans. And then they're sent to Dresden. They're in this horrible train car this and squished together with a whole bunch of other men for several days. And then they're put into Dresden, which is this beautiful city. And it's it's gorgeous. And then they're put to work. And then Dresden was bombed by the Allies in 1945 in February, like 13th, 14th, 15th, somewhere around there. And so this is, they, they're they in the slaughterhouse and they're in the basement several floors below. And the only reason they lived is because they're like two or three floors below. And it was decimated. I mean, the it was firebombed. It was completely. And- there are photos of Dresden after, yes. the, um, after the bombing. And it just... just- it's, jaw it's just jaw dropping. It is. It, you just can't. You look at it and you're like, nobody could possibly have survived this. Yeah. And they come out of it with a few German sh- soldiers and the allies had done this. And so some of the German soldiers, they make their prisoners clean up. You know, th- nobody knows what to do. It's just it's sort of this huge mess. The, they're liberated. He's sent back to America He's going back to school. He's going to get married. But eventually he has some sort of a nervous breakdown. He goes to a mental hospital. He gets out. He does get married. He has some kids. He goes back to school. He and his wife go to the University of Chicago. He starts writing. And he writes a couple of novels. And he does some public relations. He does a few different things. And then in 1969, he he tries several times to talk about Dresden. He just does not know. And it's sort of this thing in history. Nobody really knows how to talk about it. It's very secretive. And and also... Yeah, I think a lot of the info wasn't available about how how bad the damage was. Right. And it's also... Yeah. Yeah. And also because... And this is... It's very controversial because some people said there was 100... 30,000 deaths. There was 200,000 deaths. There was a half a million deaths. And it's more likely it was around 25,000. So there's the far right in Germany to this day that uses it as a what aboutism. Well, okay, there were concentration camps, but what about what happened in Dresden? That kind of thing. So now for Vonnegut, what does he know? He's 22 years old. He's a prisoner of war. He's starving to death. They actually did eat this malted milk that was made for pregnant women to try to keep themselves from starving while he was there, he really did lose a friend who was shot in the head by a German soldier for petty theft for something really dumb. War is, war is bananas. War is crazy. War is, you know, it doesn't make any sense. He comes back home and he has a very disillusioned idea of what war is. And then here he is, you know, 20, 30 years later, and it's 1969, and he writes this book. And the only way he can make sense of it, so what is this novel about? Because it's not conventional. This novel slaughterhouse five it's time and space it goes he's time jumping throughout this book and his character billy pilgrim is just this very quiet man who's just jumping in time so sometimes he's a kid sometimes he's in the future sometimes he's a middle-aged man married to this very nice basic woman who's kind of loud but with kids and the son's going to be a marine one day and serve in vietnam sometimes he's an older man sometimes he's on this planet this other planet trip Trafalgar, Tramalgar, I never say it correctly, but he's, <laughs> there's these aliens that kidnap him and they they keep him in a zoo. And, and unlike being a prisoner of war in the zoo, it's much nicer, but he's still, he's still a prisoner. But sometimes he's, when he's a prisoner of war, he, re, he thinks of himself in there. And it's sort of like, is he having a mental breakdown? Is this Pete, what we now would call PTSD or PTS? which at the time, what was it called? It was just called... There was a shell shock, shell shock. or um, there was another word, another phrase, I can't remember, but yeah. Shell shock. It was, was mm-hmm. something after, per- especially World War II, that's what they were called, or World War One and Two. They would say shell shock. Like, is that what he was going through? And that's the only way he could get through it. And the novel is very interesting. Like I said, it comes out in 69, and it's a huge, massive hit. And it's one of the first to talk about Dresden. And it's one of the first to really, because he was there. He could actually talk about it from his perspective. But it's also very much an anti-war novel. And it hits when what's going on in America or around the world, but everything 
And so it's it hits like teenagers and college kids and everyone is reading this novel and it's this it's crisp writing. It starts with just this narrator saying, how am I going to write about my experience? And he's going to hang out with his college buddy and his, and his wife. And she's very upset. Like, are you just going to write one of those rah-rah war novels? And it's like, no, no, I don't want to do that. And there's a couple of points in the book where whenever, I think it's whenever somebody dies, he says, and so it goes. And that's one of the things he says. There's they jump back in time. There's different expressions that are used. Billy is someone who's in turmoil. There's a point where he just knows when he's going to die. He knows when his wife is going to die. He knows when his son and his, he knows when his, every, everyone's going to, he's got, he's, no, there's a plane crash that where everyone dies except him. He becomes a very successful ophthalmologist. And he, there's this plane crash where everyone dies except him. His wife dies on the way to come get him. There's all kinds of things. like, And he knows all this because the aliens tell him this. Is, is it that what's really happening? He's like a late night radio host at one point in New York City. And his daughter and her husband have to like take him out of the radio studio because he's saying all this stuff about aliens. It's bananas. And then he predicts his death. And there's somebody that was in the train car with him that picked him, picked him up one of his fellow soldiers that hated him. Yeah, during the war. Lazaro, mm-hmm. who hated him. Like, is later the person that kills him. He knows this, like, for years and years and years and tells us about it. Also, what happens in this novel is that Kurt Vonnegut shows up in the novel every once in a while, just out of nowhere. And he just... It, it's... It's, I was telling Margot before we got on the show, I, like I said, I read this many, many years ago when I was in college. And then I just, there's 2020, there was a version that's a graphic novel you can get. You know, obviously it's in a paper version, but you can also get a Kindle version, which is animated. That's very cool. And it was from Ryan North and Albert Montes that I really enjoyed. Oh, neat. Yeah, mine wasn't animated. I got it through my library app. Yeah. Um, of the graphic novel, but I also I read the text. <clears throat> excuse me, and I also listened to an audio version that was read by Ethan Hawke. Which oh, was interesting. Good. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's Tremalfador, and yeah, there's a there's a an adult tra- right. Tremalfador. It's hard. Nobody can pronounce. It. <laughs> right, and there's a there's. A, I watched a lot of analysis, and nobody could. Nobody could decide how and it's nobody pronounced. Nobody can decide what this book is about either. That's sort of like, because I get the, the the overwhelming thing I get from people is like, mm, what do you think it is? Like, what do you think it's about? I guess it's sort of like what you put into it is what you get out of it, I think. Yeah. I think another thing that's kind of interesting about Kurt Vonnegut um, during the writing of this book, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly, I read a really, um, <clears throat> after I visited the Kurt Vonnegut Museum, oh, I was going to say, by the way, Highly recommend that you follow the Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library on Instagram. It's a very, very cool, very interesting Instagram account. And they are going to, it's going to be his 100th uh, birthday. Oh, yes. Up. And so they're having something they're calling Vonnegut. Nice. <laughs> Yeah, is that cool? So um, it's Vonnegut underscore library. It's a really cool account. Highly, highly recommend. Um, but when I, after I visited there, I, re- I got this book. It's a dual bio. Yeah, that's it. Called um, The Brothers Vonnegut, Science and Fiction in the House of Magic. And the author's name is Ginger... Strand. It's a dual bio of Kurt and his brother, kind of like concurrently at the same time, tracking their two trajectories of their lives. One of the interesting things about Kurt Vonnegut is that um, all during the time that he was in the war, um, and and even before, his wife, his first wife that he was married to, um, basically until about the time that he's writing this book. So he's writing, he writes uh, Slaughterhouse-Five, At a time when his marriage is finally starting to come apart. But his first wife, Jane, I think was her name. Mm -hmm. um, They had been friends slash sweethearts since kindergarten. Yeah. And um, so they were really, 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 really close. Um, And even if the marriage, you know, was starting to come apart at the seams, um, 
And he was already, you know, getting pretty well known at this point. And they had, um, at, and along the way. So there's all these letters that he wrote to her. I think when he was in, in the army, he would write letters to her about like how they were going to get married and how um, she saved all his letters and how they were going to have seven children. And what ended up happening was he came back, they got married. His, at one point, his sister and her husband are die yeah. and they end up adopting their four children. So they do, in fact, end up with seven children. Yeah, she had cancer. And her husband died like the day before or the day after in a train accident. Mm-hmm. It was like something yeah. like bizarre. Just like in the book, you yeah. know, like how, how Billy and uh, Billy's in the plane crash yeah. and his father-in-law dies and then the wife dies. Yeah. It, Cause these things happen sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like people say you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think he starts, uh, he takes a job in Iowa. There's a, like a brief, Mention of him having an affair somewhere in there, um, right before he starts writing Slaughterhouse Five, and he's spending a lot of time on Cape Cod, and um, he never he kind of goes back home full time once he writes Slaughterhouse Five, and it's you know the the marriage just slowly comes apart. She eventually remarries. Jane remarried to a Harvard professor, I think it was. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> and um, and Kurt also remarried to a, I think she was a photographer, if I'm remembering. Um, but anyway, at this point in his life, when he's writing this book, uh, all of this stuff has happened. He's trying to deal with, you know, he's lost his sister. He's had, you know, this family. Um, his marriage is starting to, he's is starting to run out of gas. And um, so there's a lot that he's reckoning with in his own life. And I think it must be like what Billy goes through. And, and in the book, we should say, if you've only seen the movie, which we'll talk about in a minute, in the book, the time travel is really... Um, at a, at a really kind of like a breakneck pace, like mm-hmm. within one chapter, he'll go to six different places, basically. And it really is out of, there's no chronology there whatsoever in the book. Like you, He'll be a child. He will be minutes away from his death. He will be 44. He will be a child again. He will be, you know, it just skips all over the place. Um, but what emerges, it's like when you have, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's, you know, and you dump it out and you have all the pieces and, you know, they have these images on them and you know, they go together somehow, but you don't quite know how they're supposed to fit. And eventually, as you start like putting the edges together and that the picture begins to emerge. And so what begins to emerge with Billy is partly is what happened in the war and to him and what he observed and how that impacted the rest of his life, basically. Um, It's, and it's so well written. It's so – it sounds yeah. like when you talk about it on paper or you we're discussing it here, it sounds like such a bummer. But it is very, very funny. There are just like yeah. screamingly funny moments throughout this book. In the And you're laughing like – you're laughing and he's in a Nazi prison camp. You're laughing and he's in a hospital with a, with a head injury from a – a, a plane crash and his wife has died on the way to the hospital to see him. Spoiler alert. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and you're laughing, you know, through the whole thing. It's really good. There's it's just so good. Weird coincidences that happen in there. Also, I got, it's very human. I mean, he's like, I said, he, you're talking about like he's probably having an affair and his, his marriage is kind of ending. There's this whole point in the story where um, he meets this, this adult actress when he's on the planet and he says that he's in the the quote unquote zoo, zoo with the aliens and they want him, him to mate. And yeah. he's you know she shows up. What are you gonna do? You know when in Rome, and he says like it's the first time he can enjoy his body. You know you figure out well, like all that he had been through in the war and everything that like it's the first time he can be sensual. He can kind of like enjoy himself. I kind of get it. Like sure, this is you can kind of relax and just kind of be yourself. And, and like yeah, he's it, there's something very human about it. Like he's just been through so much and all the different things he's he's going through and and he knows when he's gonna die. He knows what like how everything is gonna turn out. So. Yeah. And so do you as the reader. Right. right? And um, and you really do, you you know, the more you, you, you're learning, again, you're learning about this whole life in these little glimpses through it, back and forth in time. And you really do as the reader become very, very attached to him. You know, you really relate to him, Billy. Um, and you can't help but think like, wow, if I were in that situation, what would I think? How would I 
process that? What would I begin to, you know, any of these moments in this human life? Um, and it's a very ordinary, in many ways, it's a very ordinary life. It's a life that hundreds of thousands of American men in particular experienced in, during that time frame. It, it's it's so good. Especially it's, those that were in battle. Yeah. Yeah. That's, and, and, um, and it really helps... Um, it really, it really helps us, I think, to understand um, history a lot in a, in a different way, mm-hmm. in, in a more in a more human way, um, in, as opposed to like this battle happened on this day or this plane crash happened on that day. And you really, it really does make you think about the the human experience of these dates and battles and and accidents and whatnot. Yeah, it's 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 special. It's different, and it it's very well received and he even says like he's he has some guilt there because he makes a ton of money off this big tragedy in his life and all these people's lives and he understands that and there's there are several documentaries that that he and times in his life where he's been asked to like talk about Dresden and like what happened since then it's been rebuilt I mean people have gone back and and but, you know, what do you do? I mean, you've been through the experience. Like for him, he has to write about it. I forgot to mention also, I mean, it's been on Twitter a little bit lately, but a couple of years, he died in 2007, a year or two before he died. There was a school in Manhattan, St. Xavier, where the teacher encouraged the kids to write to famous authors. And he was the only one that responded. They, if you look in Twitter, you could find it. And he just encouraged them to write a poem. Like, I, I encourage you to write a poem tonight. And then he said, just rip into it, memorize it, and then just rip into a bunch of pieces and throw it away. And that's your art that you did today. I just, and he did a little drawing and doodle on it. It was just really special. And, you know. That reminds me, there's a there's a really cool moment in that uh, dual biography. Because th- th- he was very close with his siblings, Mm -hmm. Um, I get the impression that it was a very close knit family. I imagine like with what their parents went through that the kids kind of bonded together. Right. Um, And there's a moment near the end of the, the bio that, um, and I think it's near the end of the brother's life and the brother, again, he's a chemist. He's a, you know, just a brilliant, brilliant scientist. And he has developed this chemical process that basically you know, a, a side effect, if you will, of this this chemical process that he has is developed, is that it makes these absolutely beautiful, like kind of like a Mandelbrot set. If you've ever seen a Mandelbrot set, you know that exists in nature, and it. it's just this really gorgeous um, patterns and colors and things that it makes. <clears throat> and he sends some to Kurt, his brother, and says, "You know, hey, I made this thing. Is this art?" Yeah, you know, it's like so it's sweet. so sweet. So it's sweet. so sweet, and and Kurt's response is basically, you know, if you think it's art, then yes, or if you know if somebody else might totally consider it to be art, then yeah, then it's art. You know, it's but it's not basically. I don't feel like it's my place to say whether it's art or not. But it's a it's just a really sweet little glimpse of that relationship that. um he respected his brother as an artist and, right. and so wanted to ask him. And also it reveals, I think, a lot about how Bernard felt about science, how passionate he was about it, that, you know, he would think of it that way. It's a very interesting bio. I don't know, man. It's such a good – I mean, if you've never read it, oh, just read – just just get it. It's a quick read. Super um, quick that read. That graphic novel is beautiful, but it's not the book. It's a good like companion to the book. Right. Um, it's super good and it's so well done. But the the experience of reading that book, I mean, and, and it's amazing how to me, I remember noticing this as a, as a kid when I read it. Um, and I always kind of thought that it was because I was a kid that I didn't really – have any like I just sort of accepted the jumping back and forth in time but reading it now as a grown-up I think it's that he sets it up so well like the the way that he sets it up with the kind of prologue of the narrator talking about I think he does such a brilliant job of setting up your expectations at a as a reader that you just don't you're not like why are we jumping back and forth because sometimes we've done books that do that and we're just like can we stop already with the can we just yeah, pick a story and stick with it. But you never feel like that with this. It's just so interesting. Every little, 
every time we are in a new place, we're learning something new about this human and his life and, and, um, and the meaning of it. Yeah, it's awesome. It is. And it ends with he's at Dresden is decimated. And all he notices are the birds that there's just birds tweeting. There's no there doesn't seem to be any life. There's no human life. You know, and not only is there no human life, but the few humans that are there that are cleaning up, you know, his friend is getting shot for for looting. Um, and, And yet, there are singing birds, like how can there be birds singing? But that is how the world works. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, and it's also banned. Uh, you know, it's one of those. Okay, why? <laughs> Again, we talked about this last week. Where we're reading these banned books this month, and and so and once again, I think we have a book where to me, I don't. Why are we banning this book? What? Yeah, like I, the stuff. This the 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 most. And this is the interesting thing when you have a book that's about basically about time travel. You know, it's basically we can call it a science fiction book. He's traveling back and forth in time. He we're we're to assume he's been abducted by aliens. He lives on this alien zoo, and yet the most grisly, most gruesome things in the book are the things that actually actually happened. Mm-hmm. That 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 are the things that are actually really true. Um, that are recorded history, and and all he's doing is retelling, telling us what actually happened, and that is the part that spanned. The truth is the part that spanned, and I don't understand why. Who's yeah. benefiting from that again? Like, so we have to ask ourselves with these banned books always: who is benefiting from keeping this book off of the shelves? Let's talk about the movie. It's directed by George Roy Hill. Let's play the trailer, and then we will get into this film. We'll take a quick break and then play the trailer. Slaughterhouse-Five, winner of Jury Award, Cannes Film Festival, 1972. Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. An extraordinary film about an extraordinary man. I have come unstuck in time. Unstuck in time. Ah! Unstuck in time. I'll be thy name. I'm a chaplain. I'm an assistant chaplain. Billy, sweetheart, the war is over. Unstuck in time. You're being transferred to a camp in Dresden. Dresden is a beautiful city. It's an open city. It's by far the safest place to be in until we get this all over with. He's a crouch. You don't look like I'm him. not. I'm an American. Prove it. Where's mommy? Where's Where's mommy? That's right. Spot? Billy, get that butt out of here. Stop! Stop! You are here. You have always been here. And you will always be here. Is he trying to blow my mind? And I just hope I can make you real proud of me from now on. Billy, you time tripping again? I can always tell you now. Slaughterhouse Five, about an extraordinary man who predicts the crash of a plane he's on. The plane's gonna crash. This is Schlachthof Fünf. Schlachthof Fünf. Slaughterhouse Five. Slaughterhouse Five, about an extraordinary man who was in Dresden when it was bombed to destruction and survived. Why did they keep Dresden a secret for so long? If you want it now, Pilgrim, or would you like it in the morning? Eins, zwei, eins, zwei, eins, zwei. Slaughterhouse Five about an extraordinary man who foretells the exact moment of his own death. Slaughterhouse-Five, about an extraordinary man who lives to enjoy the sexiest night in outer space. Did you see you're frightening the court? Are you mating now? Could we have the night canopy, please? Are you mating now? From the creators of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, a George Roy Hill, Paul Monash production. 
Marco, I think one of the most interesting things about this movie, and I don't know how you felt, but I think the actor who plays Billy Pilgrim is Michael Sachs. I think he's really good. I was very, very impressed. Um, you know, first of all, let, as if you heard, if you heard the first half of this show, <laughs> then you, even if you've never read Slaughterhouse Five, you are by now aware that this is a pretty tall order for a movie. For an actor to do, like how many ages uh -huh. he has to convey yeah. and how much he has to, because yeah. Billy's also kind of a cipher. He's so like such a, mm -hmm. such a nice guy and he's sort of just reacting to what's going on around yeah. him. Yep. That, yep. That's tough to, to kind of ask somebody to do. Mm -hmm. And he didn't, mm -hmm. he acted for maybe a dozen years and then it just looks like he just went into business. Like he just left yeah. the show business and yeah. just. It's a very good performance. It's, it really is. It's, um. It's super good, yeah. and I, I can't believe I never saw. I don't know how I never saw this movie before, but I, yeah. I just for a book that I love so much. Um, yeah, I just never had. Yeah, but let's talk about our director. Yeah, George Roy Hill. He also directed The Sting, which was very popular. Oh, yeah, and that, I think that would come out a and year a little later. movie, <laughs> which Cassidy movie and called the Sundance Butch Kid. Cassidy. <laughs> and Slapshot. Uh, There's like a bunch yeah, of movies. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff with him. It, it, it's it's does very well. It premieres at Cannes Film Festival. Valerie Perrine is in this movie. She's gorgeous. She's always fun. Uh, let's see. Ron Liebman is our Lazaro. He's really great. It's. I think it's. They set the action in. So they couldn't film it in Dresden because it was still being rebuilt. Yeah, this is not that long. You know, when, when they're it's filming it, it's years. not. Yeah. Um, so it's in Prague. Have you ever been to Prague? I've never been to Prague. I have. Um, really? Uh, I've yeah. always wanted to see it. Is it, is it amazing? Well, it's it looks in the movie. It looks freaking amazing. amazing. I looked at that. Mm. I'm like, that's the bridge. I know that bridge. That's oh, it's neat. Praha. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's interesting. It's a So it's an interesting film. I... I think I really liked it. I think it does capture. I think Kurt Vonnegut, by the way, loved the adaptation. This he yeah. said he was very very happy with it. They so the descript you forgot to describe like the aliens are described like the opposite of a toilet plunger. Yeah, so it's like in um in the book the way they're described, it's like if you had the plunger part of the plunger with the and then at the end of the handle is a like a hand, like a five fingered hand with an eye in the middle, right? right. Have an eye in the middle of like the palm of the hand. Um, and they're green. And they're green. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're these just like little hand plunger people, uh, which is really cool. In But of course, in the movie, and I, I think this is a great decision, we don't ever see them. No, you can't do which that. Which is great. There, yeah. There's no there's a, digital yeah. effects. It would look terrible. It would look, it would look like really Muppets. Stupid. It yes. would look really bad. Um, it would totally take you out of the of the movie. Another thing I was going to say, um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff about the aliens and how, if they exist, um, their uh, view of time and fate and free will, they don't think there is any. One of the things that I think is really cool in the book is they talk about how so humans are we're very limited because we can only see in three dimensions. Um, so we, there's a lot of things we're missing and we're not understanding. And one of the things they said is um, that there's not just two genders; that there are, are seven genders, and that or yeah, or I forget maybe how many I forget. But in any case, it takes seven people to make a baby, a human baby. That there are seven people involved. So every baby has seven parents, um, and if one of those humans is not part of the picture that baby doesn't happen oh, which wow. i thought was really interesting so I, I i love that they made the choice in the movie to say well the aliens live in the fourth dimension so we don't get to see them we can only hear them which um fine yeah <laughs> They film it. It's beautifully filmed. So it's part of it's in Minneapolis and part of it's in Prague. And they open with him in like they do with the book, like he's in the war and it's snowing and they're they're and they and part of the indignity is that they take away his coat. They put a woman's coat on him. 
they've bleached his hair so he looks just very green and and very young you know he has the gap tooth they take a picture of him smiling and they're going back and forth in time with him which is smart like you know because he's like a successful salesperson and an ophthalmologist and stuff like that um i thought this was also really interesting i don't know about you but his wife in the movie is a woman named sharon gans i don't know if you learned about her no what (laughs) Turns out, Margo, like she did a couple of acting gigs and then she and her husband lived in San Francisco and they started a cult. And then what? They, bust the bus. Whoa. they started this cult and it was a theater cult kind of thing. Like you had to join the cult Whoa. and then you had to see their plays. And then the cult got busted. So they moved to New York and they were like charging people 400 a month. They were living at the plaza. She just died like a year ago. It's banana. Like life is just bananas. But there's some really amazing performances. And then the other one, Holly Near plays the daughter, and she's like a folk artist here. Yeah. There's some interesting people. Perry King plays his son, and he's like the same age as Michael Sachs. And he <gasps> also has the bleached hair. Sorry. I just I was just briefly quickly looking up uh what's her name? Sharon, Sharon Gans. Gans. I know somebody who was part of this. Um, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's it's yeah. bananas. Yeah. Look I, up, we, we had some, we had we knew somebody who got involved with that and we were like they are they, they're gone. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That's insane. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Okay. Back to the other actors. The she, I really love the one that plays the daughter. I think she's Holly Near. She's great. She's, um, she's great in the movie. She's also she's everybody's a, so good in this. Yeah. So Ron Liebman is Lazaro, and um, I have to say, like, I thought the um, the acting was very good all around. Who plays third for the Tigers? The Tigers? The Detroit Tigers. Who is it? I don't know. The fuck? Came into my head. Listen, you guys go on without me. Shut up. Where's your weapon, soldier? I don't have one. Everybody's got one. one. I'm a chaplain. I'm an assistant chaplain. What's Sir, your name, Sergeant? I love the pilgrim. Do you know why this got three sides on it, pilgrim? No. It makes a slit that don't close up. Gee, that's great. If you stick a GI knife in the guy and it makes a slit, right? Right. A slit closes up, right? Right. Well, this makes a three-sided slit. It kills you, pilgrim. Oh! Ah! That son of a bitch ditches us, I'll kill him. We could surrender. What? We could surrender, couldn't we? We just have to stay here and listen to me. Me and the corporal and the Dago, we're Americans. We don't surrender. You got that? He's took off. I Agreed. like the guy who plays Eugene Derby. It's he's Eugene Roche. I he's- thought, yeah, different. He's in the book. He's a um, <coughs> excuse me. In the book, the character of Derby is a professor, mm-hmm. so he's very you know professorly. Um, but I like the kind of more fatherly energy that that we have in the movie. I think works really well for the movie. Yeah, we have Valerie Perrine as like the sexy movie star Montana Wild Hack. Uh, Kevin Conway, Sorrel Book, Boss Hog, Blo- Roberts Blossom. He was the old man in Ugh. Home Alone, the yeah. like, next door. Yeah, I, I, we just covered a movie for Dorking Out called Vision Quest. He's like an old man in that. He's like born old. <laughs> he was. He was. You no, know, he's not that old in Slaughterhouse no. Five, but no. he looks. He's just got that kind of voice and character energy yeah. of that. He's um, wild. Valerie Bob Cody. Valerie Prime. I always think of the um, the Village People movie. Don't can't stop the music. Can't stop the music. They play that apparently in Australia, like New Year's Eve. That's like a tradition. Oh. With uh, Caitlyn Jenner and the Village People. Interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. I forgot Caitlyn Jenner was in that movie, too. Yep. I mean, it's great. And I will say one thing. Oh, and we have a score by Glenn Gould. Yes. I think is, it works pretty well, I think. Yeah. You know, to, to have something that's going back and forth in time and to choose classical music as the it's, backdrop for it everything. It makes the is, most sense. If there was a lot of yeah, I agree. music, it would be a really kind of It would annoying. be jarring. It would be very yeah. jarring. 
One thing I will say that's different in the movie than in the book. So the book, as we just have been saying, you know, the book is jumping all over the place the entire time. The movie seems to be jumping all over the place the entire time. But the narrative about the war, I think, is actually told in chronological order. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. It doesn't seem that way. Um, so, which I can understand. You know, for a movie, it's a different ask for a movie audience than it is for a, a reader. Um, and I think that's a good choice to have that be kind of like the thread that goes all the way through. But I mean, everybody, everybody, like Elliot Rosewater in the hospital bed yeah. next to him, um, his mom, Billy, the Billy. war's over. The war's over, Billy. <laughs> and he's completely traumatized and he's under the blanket. Yeah. Yeah. There's the scene where Sharon Gans, she's coming to the hospital and she's just like screaming, Billy, Billy. Just, oh, wow. It's such a scene. It like also once again, like we used to say, cars used to be ginormous, just gigantic. So when they crashed into each other, they made they were so big. They They were were like this. They were larger than the room. I mean, Uh, yeah, they're wider than the room I'm sitting in right now. Um, you guys have no idea, and I love the scenes where they have the um. Remember we used to have those bench seats in the front seat? Like the front yeah. seat was like one big upholstered bench, like in a booth in a restaurant. You could fit three people easily. Oh, easily. In the front. Easily. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. You, you didn't could. have to think twice about it. I think the the makeup is really well done. Agreed. I it's think, impressive. It, they really do make him look middle aged and then old. They do. And they I do. think also Ron Liebman, especially, that I said I at said the this end. Love, yeah, he looked like Tommy Lee Jones is Ty Cobb. He does. <laughs> he does. At the very that's so he's funny. He totally does. Very specific, but I was like, that's Tommy Lee Jones they made him look like. Because Ron Liebman's only like 30 or something when he made this movie. He's not that, he's very young. It's There's some really amazing performances in there. And there's some really good makeup. It's a weird movie because it's a weird book. I mean, I wonder when film critics saw it. If you, This is my question. Like, can you follow this movie if you never read the book, if you don't know what it's about? Oh, that's a interesting question i wonder but i mean i i mean there's no way for us to really answer because we didn't right. but um but i did i was trying to sort of pay attention to that as i was watching the movie and there is an attempt you know like the first thing we see is that he's writing this letter he's typing this letter and this is a scene in the book also but it's kind of it's not right at the beginning of the book but in the movie it opens with um Billy typing. He's he's middle aged. He's widower now, mm-hmm. and he's in his big empty house. And his daughter is frantically trying to get him to answer the door, and he's typing a letter to like a newspaper editor, and he's starting to talk about like I am unstuck in time. Um, I go back and forth. Sometimes I'm in World War II. Sometimes I'm on the planet Trump, tr- whatever Trump yeah. Trump 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 I don't know. Um, anyway, but he so it's sort of setting us up to like oh this guy. Is he, he, is we're going to go back and forth in time. We're going to see aliens because it does sort of set you up. I don't know if it does it as effectively as the novel does. Yeah, it's hard for me to say. But I thought it was so well done. Like I love the whole scene when the um, and I don't remember this being in the book. At least not like this, where Billy and his family are at the drive-in. Okay, and they're watching that movie. <laughs> so. 
did he not read the review or something? Because that's a pretty racy movie that to see with your teen at a drive in. At a drive in with and and how old is Perry King? Like is he is he playing? Like is he like he's supposed to be like sixteen or I something guess, like I, that? It's goofy. Um, it's the, a very good scene. It's, but I like it. I think it's <laughs> I think it's well done. Um, but I, I think if I remember correctly, in the book, he's Billy's by himself and he goes into like an X-rated movie theater. Yeah, he is he's in San Francisco right? or something. Yeah. And he yeah, goes to he's one in of the those, big city. Yeah, he goes to one of those X rated theaters that you yeah. know you put a quarter in and you get you know. Right. And she's there on the screen. But um but I thought that was good for the movie. I liked it. And I like the wife being all like outraged. Yeah. And um she's I great. really liked this. She's really good in this movie. Yeah. I mean just to turn out to be a major um joke. she's turned out to be like cult leader is right. all. But it's a great performance. I mean she's I really like I would say the movie gives us more of their relationship than the book does. Uh and I like it. I liked it. I thought it was good. So did I. I also What's old is new again. There's a few things that that are happening in the news now and in in the world now that I saw like on the screen. Like they're having dinner and the Brits welcome them and they're like, "You're not going to believe this. They send us five times what we need, so we have so much food." And these are guys that have been starving in the woods since the Battle of the Bulge. And one guy shows up and he's wearing the Nazi insignia on his uniform because he's kind of adapted. Yes. Now that is a moment. It's a, I think it's really, and it's from the book and it's yeah. also related to, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the works of Kurt Vonnegut, yeah. he has this whole like universe mm-hmm. of um, characters and that move in and out of his various works. Sometimes it's the main character. Sometimes it's a background person who just kind of passes through for one scene of the book. Um, like Elliot Rosewater. Elliot Rosewater is in several of, Kurt Vonnegut's books and is this the center of at least one of them. There's a book he wrote called Mother Night. Right. Which is uh which was made into a movie starring is it Nick Nolte? Nick Nolte. Yeah. Um about this American who is forced, really, who's forced to become a double agent kind of, like a spy. Um, because he has a wife who's German and um, during World War II. And he becomes this like, a quote unquote, American Nazi, this like cowboy Nazi. You don't know, like in Mother Night, you don't, you, you're wondering like, is he really a Nazi? Like, is he really believing the stuff he's saying? Or is he cleverly like playing the Nazis? Right. Like, what's he doing? So he shows up. They bring, the Germans bring this, the cowboy Nazi in and he's got this, like, his outfit. It's exactly how it's described in the book. Right. Um, it's amazing. Uh, and he shows up and he's trying to convince the um, the prisoners to back the Germans because this is before the bombing. They're like, listen, you know, the war's not going your way. And maybe you should join the winning team because, hey, we're all white here anyway, right? So why are we trying to – Right. What are we, why are we trying to kid ourselves? You know, let's let's hitch our wagon to this star and, and ride it all the way. And then the bombing starts. The allies start bombing. Um, but that scene I, – I, the one thing I will say is – and I think I may have already said it. So forgive me if I'm repeating myself because I still have a little bit of brain fog. Um, is, is that the movie is not as funny as the book. No, um, it still has a lot of humor, and it is very Vonnegut esque. Uh, Vonnegut Gutchian. It is very, it's very Kurt Vonnegut type humor, but it's not as much, not nearly as much as in the book. Um, but that scene in particular, where Campbell, the the cowboy Nazi, shows up, is very funny. It's very funny. I mean, and you find you can't help but be chuckling at this, like, who is this guy? Right. What? What is he? And, and you see that even the, the soldiers are like, what is this that you've brought in here? Like, what are we doing here? It's great. I love that scene. But yes, that's the same character from from Mother Night, if you've ever seen that movie or read that book. It, it does pretty well. It's not really nominated for very much. It's nominated for Saturn Award. And then the Michael Sachs was nominated for his performance. I mean, it does okay. But it's it's funny. It's just not really like a movie. It's been it's 50 years. It was released 50 years mm-hmm. ago. I thought it would be mm-hmm. a little bit more. I don't know. I, I 
enjoyed it. I think it was a decent interpretation, adaptation, uh-huh. especially yep. just a few years after the book comes out and what the kind of special effects they had at the time and the budget that they had. They handle it really well. They do. Um, I think the screenplay is excellent. Yes. Fine, family man, and I'm just a The plane's going to crash. Oh, come on, Billy boy. 25 minutes, the whole thing cracks up. You can't get out of your seat. Stop the plane, no please, stop the plane. Sir. It's going to crash. Back in your seat. I've organized this charter. You I'm want responsible. To be removed from this but plane. you don't understand. We've got our clearance. We're going to take off now, and everything's going to be all right. Now just buckle in and leave the driver to us. Lousy, drunk son of a bitch. God, I hate these charter flights. impressed with it yeah i mean between the two i take the book over the movie like a thousand percent because you get you get everybody's you know you get so many great backstory like that um that character the one the one in the war with him weary that's he's Mm -hmm. the the, that whole character is so interesting and like his whole backstory and his whole history and um you know and eventually it leads to uh, Billy's eventual <laughs> murder, but um, you know the many, really many wing in the in the train car, and they gets ditched. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this isn't so, so bad, you know. Oh no, that's a different guy. Oh, that's that, like that, a, oh god, they get in the train car, and there's this one guy who goes, "I know this seems kind of bad, but I've been in much worse." You could this is a Nazi train car oh my going god, god knows where. Like, oh, that would be my. <laughs> I would be stuck in that car with that person, right? That like I've been in much worse situations than this. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Uh, it did. I, I mean, it's again. You know, they're missing Kurt, that. Kurt Vonnegut like gives you these these very human moments. I mean, that's what happens in these kinds of situations, and and um, and, and so yeah, I agree. The book. I mean, because you get so many more, more of those moments with all these tertiary uh, and background characters that are are so fun to read, and um, and really helps the story too. You know, really. Um, they add so much, each of these little people who kind of come in and out. Um, and you just can't afford the time spent with that in, in the movie. And I, and I think the movie, though, does a very good job of um, of making up for that, you know, as much as possible. I, I really liked the way that the um, – I just liked all of the World War II um, sequences, yeah. I think. are, And if they weren't really brilliantly done, the movie would not hold up at all. No. Um, and it is an amazing contrast to the, you know, John Wayne, Lee Marvin, uh, kind of macho, Which is um, everybody's despised. over 40, uh, in the war for some reason. And, um, it does tell it, it really, um, in, in, in a way it must've been, you know, in a much more realistic way. And we have to think too, like Todd and I just recently watched, um, Operation Mincemeat. Have you ever seen Operation Mincemeat? Mm-mm. About so it was about um, it was classified for a really long time. It was about this uh, covert operation that Churchill approved, where they they got the 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 they were going to attack Sicily, 
Um, and the Nazis, they knew that the Nazis, because of Bletchley Park and the code, da, 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 so they knew the Nazis had found out about it and were ready. They were going to like waiting to pounce on the allies in, in when they were going to do this maneuver in Sicily. And so they go through this whole rigmarole where they get um, basically like a like a homeless guy um, who who may or may not have committed suicide. He had died in just the right way that they dressed him up as an officer and they gave him this whole backstory and gave him a sweetheart and, um, and, uh, had, had special classified papers on quote unquote classified papers on him that said that they were, the allies weren't going to attack Sicily. They were actually going to attack Greece and they planted him in the ocean, um, as though he had drowned and he washes up on the shores of Spain and the word gets to somehow the Nazi spies find find out and Hitler sends all the troops to Greece. And so the allies move into Sicily. Oh, my goodness. And so it was called Operation Mincemeat. And it's the lead is uh, it's Colin Firth uh, joint. And um, but there's this running gag. <coughs> Excuse me. There's this running gag throughout the movie because you have these characters moving in now because it's all spy stuff, right? So you have Ian Fleming is moving in and out of the picture. Rule Doll is moving out of the picture, and there's this running gag that everybody around these two guys who are running this operation is writing a book about the war, and like oh, another writer, like what are you doing over there? Oh, I'm just working on my book. Like everybody is writing a book about World War Two, and um. You know, when I think about this book, and it's this is right after this. This book is written not long after um, the Spy Who Loved Me, yeah. which is again, woof. Yeah, not what a great a, book. It's one of the worst books Fabulous we've read. Fabulous movie, <laughs> great movie, fun movie. Not, it's a terrible book. But you know, lots of really like macho shoot 'em up. Yeah. You know. To- what we would now say toxic masculinity type books about World War II and um, and glorifying it. And not yeah. only glorifying it, but glorifying it to the end of, um, you know, promoting a- yet another war. Mm-hmm. So um, it's really, it's, it's, it's so, I think it's just, it's not like anything else of its genre. I mean, it's just not. Right. It's fantastic um, and funny. And so, yeah, book. Yeah. Book. But yeah. I, I loved the movie. I really thought the movie was – I was so impressed. Yeah. Very impressed. Yeah. yeah. I think you should definitely check it out, but it's definitely going to be the book for me. And I, I yeah. super enjoyed the graphic novel. I thought it was – It's really good. Really well done. It was really mm-hmm. interesting. And there are just so many great I've, – I've discovered YouTube channels about, you know – Kurt Vonnegut and, and oh yeah, and, and people they're just huge fans out there. Yeah, Kurt Vonnegut also um, an early, early interview, pretty early or on. I can't remember if it was in the '60s or the '70s, but he he, I saw this interview where he says that um, he says that uh, the biggest public health threat in the United States is gun violence. Mm. It's like 50 years ago, you know. Um, and he basically goes on to predict, like, if we don't get a handle on on gun violence right now, like such and such and such and such, and here we are. Um, yeah, and so I often like, wonder. Very nice man. Very, very everybody loved yeah. him. Like everybody loved yeah. him. He was a really nice person. Very very humble. Very easy to deal with. I mean, just mm-hmm. yeah. But definitely like a a. a a diet in the wool humanist and mm-hmm. you know very a big champion of of humanitarian causes you know for the his whole life uh yeah really interesting mm-hmm. um but i loved reading this book again loved it loved it it's i'm so glad i it was totally holds up yeah so which band book are we doing next i figured kind of in the sci-fi realm but it's a. Uh, it's called The Giver by Lois. Um, sorry, let me look this up. Lois Lowry. It's oh, I love Lois Lowry. I don't think I've ever read that book. I never read it either. It was a Netflix movie like eight years ago. It came out in the nineties. One hundred seventy nine pages, and it's a dystopian. It has Jeff Bridges in the movie, and it's oh. it's. Also, like one of the most banned books ever. 
for kids. I, I've I've never read it. I've never read it either. It's a young adult novel. Hmm. And it's controversial. I loved. Um, she wrote a book that I read probably probably around the same time I read Slaughterhouse Five. Um, she wrote a book in the seventies called A Summer to Die. Did you ever read that book about the the girl whose sister is dying? Yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. They, her family, I think they're academics also, and they move to the, they move like out of the city to, to a nicer house and a kind of more quieter life um, because it turns out the, the older sister um, is terminally ill. The younger sister doesn't know it at first, um, but I loved that book. Um, but I've never read The Giver. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just, oh. yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm into it. Let's do it. Okay. Cool. And it's um, it's streaming everywhere, but it's also it's on Netflix. So if you already have a Netflix account, it makes it okay. easier and it's easy to get. All righty then. So that's our next book and movie. Also think about scary movie month for, for October. October. Nothing too horror. Nothing really. No gore. Go- please. No gore, please, for, <laughs> for October. December, we do Disney because we've done all of the major holiday ones. We, You guys, we've done so many. Because that's something we've always done is the is the holidays, uh, holiday movies. And after eight years. Yeah. Whew. Yeah. 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 Um, but please, you know, please send us your suggestions. We're always looking for ideas. And Margo, where can they find you? You can find me online at coloniabook.com and all of my social media callouts are at She's Nacho Mama. And where can they find you and pre-order, or actually just order, it's out now, isn't it out? No, it's pre-order. Oh, it's pre-order, sorry. Pre-order, see Margo, I'm trying to like <laughs> sneak in the announcement of the book coming out. But Margo D has a book that is available for pre-order now. Can you tell us about it? Yes, it's called Filmed in Brooklyn and it's all about movies that have been filmed in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. I worked on it for two years. I'm really proud of it. It's available for pre-order wherever you get your books. 